Hello and welcome to video two for week six. In this video, I'm introducing the second application of matrices. And this is really quite remarkable. That in addition to encoding linear systems and the row reduction thing and all the things we did with that, determining dimensions, determining linear combinations, matrices also completely and perfectly encode linear transformations. So the thing that I defined in video one for this week, the linear transformation that preserved flat things that preserved addition and scalar multiplication, each linear transformation is perfectly and completely indexed by a matrix. And this is done by defining a matrix action on vectors. And I'm going to start in R2 and R3 to make this clear, and then I'll give the general form. So anytime I have a matrix in R2, or a two by two matrix, it can act on a vector in the following way. We're always going to go across the rows of the matrix and down the vector. So I'm going to first take the first row of the matrix and sort of like a dot product, multiply and add going down the vector. So it's going to be a times x to get this term, plus b times y going across and down to get this term. And the first component of the output will be ax plus by. Then I'll go to the second row of the matrix. I get c times x plus d times y, again, going across the matrix and down. So the second component will be cx plus dy. And what that has done is that has taken some vector in R2 to some other vector in R2. And it turns out that this action is going to be a linear action and that all linear transformations, in fact, can be encoded as this action. This works the same way in R3. We go across the rows of the matrix and down the vector. So the first component of the output will be going across the first row, a times x, b times y, c times z, add them together. The second component will be going across the second row, d times x, e times y, f times z, add them together. The third component will be going down across the third row, g times x, h times y, i times z, add them together. And in this way, I get a transformation that sends a vector in R3 to some other vector in R3. The general matrix action works the same way. We go across and we go down. So if I wanted to write a general matrix, this is a, an M by N matrix and acts on a vector in Rn. So if, that, if the matrix is not square, the number of columns determines the action. So here I have N columns. And since I go across, I'm going to count all N columns while I'm going down counting all n entries of this vector. That's why the n has to match. And the first row here is going to be a1 times the first one, a1, 2 times the second, all the way down. That's going to give me the first row. Then I could go across the second row, get the second output, all the way down to the mth output. And the output is a vector that has 1, 2, m entries. So the transformation is in Rm. So that's a nice thing to remember that a matrix that is m by n is a transformation from Rn to Rm. So a three by two matrix is a transformation from R2 to R3. The number of columns is the input, the number of rows is the output. Let's give some examples to try and make this clear. The action is a zero matrix. Well, the zero matrix multiplies a bunch of things times zero and adds them up. That gives you zero. The zero matrix is the matrix that sends everything to the origin that's going to preserve all the algebraic operations because at, in the output, all you're doing is adding up a bunch of zeros. And we treat the point zero as a flat thing for the purposes of preserving flat things. It does collapse everything down, but that does fit within our notions of preserving flat things because we consider the origin as sort of the basic dimension zero flat object. I defined the identity matrix when we defined matrices and told you it was special. This is why it's special. It's the unique matrix that sends every vector to itself. Because this is going to be 1 times x plus 0y plus 0y. That gives me x. This is going to be 0x plus 1 times y plus 0z gives me y. And the third row is 0x plus 0y plus 1 times z gives me z. So that's why we had these ones down the diagonal. That was the purpose for this special structure. The identity matrix is the matrix that has the operation, the transformation of sending everything to itself typically called the identity transformation. 
Very similar to the identity matrix is a diagonal matrix. So instead of having ones down the diagonal, we can have other numbers down the diagonal. And what these are going to do is these are going to stretch the axis directions. And these are called dilations. So this one is going to stretch all the x's out by some factor a, or shrink them if a is less than 1. Stretch the y-axis out by b. Stretch the z-axis out by c. And leave sort of all the other in-between things alone, sort of acts on each axis independently. The last thing I want to define in this video is the notion of composition and what it does to matrices. So in the first video, I said that once we had these linear transformations, we could compose them. Well, if they're encoded as matrices, then the composition should mean something for matrices. So if we have some matrix A and some matrix B that represents transformations, then what is the composition A composed B? It should have a matrix. So that means there should be a way of taking one matrix and another matrix and producing a third matrix that represents the composition. There is. This is called matrix multiplication. And let me tell you how it works. And it's a reasonably complicated little algorithm, but hopefully you can follow it. I'm going to write the first matrix thinking of everything as a row vector. I'm going to write the second matrix thinking of everything as a column vector. And then the matrix multiplication is what I get by going across the first matrix and down the second matrix, very much like I did with the matrix action, and taking dot products. So this row dot this column shows up here. This row dot this column shows up here. This row dot this column shows up here. And these are dot products of vectors. This is a bunch of entries of the vector. This is a bunch of entries of the vector. Take the dot product, I get a scalar. And I go all the way across until I get this row dot this column shows up here. And then I move on to the next row and go through all the columns again. And then I move on to the next row and go through all the columns again until I get to the last row and I go through all the columns again. So all the entries of this new matrix multiplication are dot products of the rows of the first matrix and the columns of the second matrix. Let me show you what this looks like in an actual example. So here's two two by two matrices that I multiply together. So I take the first row and the first columns, that's going to be dot product of 1, 2, plus negative 6, negative 3. So that's going to be 2 plus 18. That's going to be 20. So that gives me 20 here. In the first spot, it's the first row in the second column, in the first column. In this spot, it's the first row in the second column. So I do this and I do this. So that's going to be 1 times 2 plus negative 6 times negative 5. So going, going down the second column. Uh, so that's going to be 2 plus 30. So that's going to be 32. So I get a 32 there. And then in the second row, in the first column, I take the second row and the first column. So negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. 0 times negative 3 is 0. I get negative 6. And lastly, writing too much on top of these things, I get the second row and the second column. So the second row and the second column, negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. 0 times negative 5 is 0. Negative 6 plus 0 is 0. So that gives me these four new entries as the dot products of the rows of the first matrix and the columns of the second. Very briefly, let me talk about some properties of this. So this is a new multiplication on matrices. We have two matrices, we can multiply them together. And that's a very, very strange thing. There's a whole new structure. And as pure mathematicians, as algebraists, we're really interested in what, what does this structure do? What properties does it have? What can we do with this structure? So let me, let me briefly talk about what's going on. So say I have three matrices with these sizes. Now notice the sizes have to match. If I have A times B, then these L's have to have match. If I have B times C, then these M's have to match. That's because of this dot product of rows and columns. I need the same number of things in the rows and columns to make the dot product work. So I can multiply three matrices together and bracket them. The bracketing doesn't matter. Matrix multiplication is associative. Let me define that term earlier in the course if you hadn't heard it before. Uh, a binary operation is associative if we can bracket it in whatever order we want. So multiplication of matrices 
is associative. And that makes sense for composition. So this says do C, then do B, then do A. That should only be one thing in a composition. So it makes sense that this is associative. If I, I is the identity matrix and that subscript is the size, so this is the identity matrix in dimension L, this is the identity matrix in dimension K, that if I multiply by the identity matrix, nothing happens. And you can check this with the algorithm. This also makes sense for transformations. The identity matrix doesn't do anything. So if I do the identity matrix, then A, what's the same thing as doing A? If I do A, then the identity matrix, that's also the same thing as doing A. But remember that if I'm interpreting these as transformations, the thing on the right happens first. So in this product, C happens, then B, then A. That's how composition works. Composition works from right to left. And lastly, and we'll talk about this more in future videos because it's very important, matrix multiplication is in general not commutative. And it's not even like the cross product where it's anti-commutative, it's not. We get, there's no sort of negative sign that makes this work. AB and BA can often be very, very different transformations. And we'll give a bunch of examples later of how that looks like and, and what kind of situations we have where we have different order of transformations. But this is really our first example of matrix where the order really, or multiplication where the order really matters, where we have a fundamentally non-commutative way of doing things.